praise you. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you, God. We glorify you today, God. The radio crackled to life inside the air traffic control station with the words no one has ever wanted to hear. I have no idea how to fly the airplane. The words were spoken by Darren Harrison, a passenger, the pilot of the single engine Cessna 208 that Harrison was a passenger on had gone incoherent, was unresponsive. Harrison, a passenger aboard the plane, uh, he, had, he was making his way home from a fishing trip in the Caribbean, was speaking to the air traffic controllers on Tuesday, May 10th, 2022 at a Florida airport. The pilot had gone unconscious, and when Harrison realized, uh, he realized that when the plane went into a nosedive, he crawled ahead to the cockpit. He was able to remove the pilot from the pilot seat. He was able to find the headset which had come unplugged, and he was able to plug it back in, all while the plane was in a steep nosedive. Harrison, at this point, he spoke into the mic and the headset. Hello, hello, I, I have no idea how to fly this airplane. Can you think of a more daunting and terrifying situation to be in? On an airplane, you don't know how to fly with an unconscious pilot as you're in a steep nosedive. Fortunately, one of the air traffic controllers, Robert Morgan, who was also a certified flight instructor, was, he was on break, but he was rushed back to the control tower to take control of the situation. However, Morgan had never flown a Cessna 28. Additionally, they didn't know exactly where the plane was. All they knew is that a voice had come over the radio saying, I have no idea how to fly this airplane. He was able to pull up a schematics of the controls of a Cessna 208, and based on that picture, he was able to speak uh, to Harrison now in the pilot seat and try to guide him through the process. He was really calm, Morgan said. He said, I don't know how to fly. I don't know how to stop this thing, even if I do get on the runway. So Morgan began to walk him through instructions. He instructed him to pull on the controls, to pull the plane out of the nosedive, told him to, to try to hold the wings level and see if you can start lowering at a, at a more appropriate rate, um, push forward on the controls to descend at a slow rate of speed. The air traffic controller is giving him all this instructions as this man is sitting in the airplane. He doesn't know how to fly, trying to learn, listening to the voice in his headset. Almost miraculously, Morgan was able to guide Harrison along the coastline until they could determine where he was. At that point, he was able to give him instructions to the Palm Beach Airport, the largest airport in the area, and was able to guide him to a successful landing on the runway. The air traffic control told some commercial pilots uh, that were waiting in line to go, and they said that was a passenger that, that just landed that airplane. And you can imagine the commercial pilots uh, exclaiming, wow, that was incredible, the airplane that they just saw landed by a, a passenger who had no idea how to fly. But the whole time, Harrison, that passenger, was totally dependent on the voice in his headset because he was able to recognize the situation he was able to uh, somehow block out the stress, the roar of the engine, the circumstances around him, the danger he was in. He was able to follow the instructions that came through the headset. Although he couldn't see, didn't know what to do, he decided to trust the voice that he was hearing and his life was saved. So I want to talk to you today about the danger of a disconnected headset. The danger of a disconnected headset. We're going to talk about hearing God's voice, hearing the still, small voice of God, distinguishing God's voice from the noise in our lives, specifically discerning God's voice from our own emotions and thoughts and ideas, the danger of a disconnected headset. The headset is what helps the, help the air traffic controller speak and give instructions to that uh, learning on the job pilot. But it also helps to block out the noise around us. And so God's going to help us through his power to learn how to do that and apply that to our lives. Would you pray with me before we move on into the word? God, we pray for your will to be done today. We pray for you to receive all the glory. God, I pray for me, the speaker of your word. God, I pray that there would be a pure flow of your spirit today. 
God, that your voice would be speak to us, although it may be my words and the sound of my voice, God, I pray that your spirit would speak to us today. I pray for the hearers of the word, God, that the spirit of revelation, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding would be here today, and that there would be faith in everyone who hears the word of God to believe that you want to speak to them, to believe that they can hear your voice for themselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated this morning. It's important to believe and to settle first and foremost that God wants you to hear his voice. John chapter 10 verse 27. I'll start here today. John 10 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Three or four times throughout John chapter 10, Jesus repeats this phrase. My sheep, they know my voice. They hear my voice. Based on John chapter 10, I believe God is talking to all of his sheep. He doesn't say some hear my sheep. He doesn't say the sheep dog hears, uh, hears my voice. He doesn't say some uh, lambs hear my voice. Some who are, no, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice. I believe you were born with an ability to hear God in your spirit. So the trick is not kind of learning how, but it's sharpening a skill that's already within us and growing into hearing the shepherd's voice. So is that really true? Do sheep really know their shepherd's voice? We're going to pull up a video that demonstrates this and see if these sheep recognize their shepherd's voice. This is not the shepherd. Someone else speaks to the sheep, and the sheep don't respond. It's just noise in the background. But the voice of the shepherd, they recognize the voice. Ears perk up, look over, see their shepherd calling to them, and move in response to the voice of the shepherd. My sheep know my voice. I know them, and they follow me. There's some a little bit of groundwork I want to lay for this, and I appreciate Bishop Hansen giving me the opportunity to speak. He wanted, asked me to put a thought or two together on this subject. It's not really a part of our Holy, Holy, Holy series, but it's like Holy, Holy, Holy adjacent maybe. It's along the same lines. There's some important ways that God talks to us, and so um, we want to un- make sure that we understand uh, the different ways that God speaks to us so that we can know his voice, we can distinguish his voice from our thoughts and emotions. Um, Four important ways God talks to us first is through the Word of God. God talks to us through the Scripture, through the Bible. It's so important that we have a foundation of Scripture in our lives and that we are constantly learning the Scripture and the Bible to hear God's voice through that foundational um, element of the voice of God in our lives. Number two is the wisdom of spiritual authority in your lives. God has given us a pastor. God has put elders in our lives, and God speaks to us through pastors, through ministers, through elders, especially those that are in spiritual authority over us. Um, 
Another way that God speaks to us is through the wonders of God. God speaks to us through the supernatural. There's visions and dreams, the gift of the Spirit. There could uh, be a, an angel that shows up and, and, and points out uh, something that, that you should know, something that you should learn, something that you should do. That's a way that God talks to us. And then through the whispers of God, the still, small Voice. So I'm focusing, if you almost would just highlight that bottom bullet point, the whispers of God, that's the focus of today. But I, I'm not overemphasizing this versus the others. It needs to be in its proper place. We need to have all the ways that God speaks to us active in our lives, and we'll see how they kind of work together today. I could easily preach a sermon series on the importance of the Word of God and how to understand the Word. And I could certainly uh, preach about the wisdom of spiritual authority and submission to spiritual authority speaking into our lives. We could do a whole class on the gifts of the Spirit and, and how to properly understand when God gives you a dream or a vision. Is it God? Is it you? Is it something else? So all of these are really important to understand, all right? I just want to kind of lay that foundation, but we're highlighting, we're zooming in on this one specific way God talks to us today, the whispers of God, the still small voice. So as we look at the still small voice, uh, we're going to look at a story in 1 Kings chapter 19, and I'll be doing a little bit kind of teaching today, maybe versus a real uh, kind of evangelistic call or, or traditional sermon that you might think of, but God is, God does have something that he wants to do today in each one of you may feel very informative for a little while, but God confirms his word. And if you will believe that God wants you to grow in your ability to hear his voice, if you will believe that God wants you to become more sensitive, more attuned, there are many I felt in prayer as I, prepare, as I prepared for this in prayer this morning that God really wants to help you go to another level and to believe that God is speaking to you and to learn, to understand, and discern. But we want to make sure that we're doing it in a biblical, scriptural way so that it guards us from being misguided. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we find the prophet Elijah, and he's at the lowest point of his life. Ironically, he just stood as the prophet of God, one against 450 false prophets. And God showed up, and fire miraculously fell and consumed the sacrifice the false prophets were killed, and the people of God uh, begin to acknowledge again that Jehovah was the true God. A huge victory. I mean, this is like going on, on Capitol Hill or something and standing up and declaring the truth and a miraculous sign from God, the fire falling and consuming the burnt sac or the sacrifice that was soaked with water. I mean, it's just incredible. What an incredible story for the prophet Elijah. But then Jezebel comes on the scene, and she threatens Elijah, threatens his life. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've had a really good day before, or a really good week, or a really good church service, or a really good breakthrough, and you're feeling that victory, and then something just hits you. Life just gets in the way, a circumstance, a situation, someone comes against you, maybe your boss at work. Elijah's had this great breakthrough moment, and then he encounters Jezebel. You see, the enemy is less concerned with you experiencing a victory than he is with you living in victory. God wants us to not just experience victories, but to live in victory. So Elijah, your story's not over yet, because Elijah hadn't anointed Elisha yet. His best work was still ahead of him. He's at his lowest point, but the best, most important things he's going to do is still to come. I take hope in that today. I might be struggling today. I might feel like, oh, I really had a breakthrough, and then it just all came crumbling down, and I don't even know what's real anymore but the best is still ahead of Elijah. And I want to tell you, the best is still ahead of you. But it all is hanging in the balance. Elijah has something to do, but it's hanging in the balance with what will happen in 1 Kings chapter 19. That's the backstory. We cut to the scene as it were. 
Elijah, this depressed, discouraged man at the point of suicide, the voice of the Lord comes and speaks to him. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. And he, the Lord, said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. God met Elijah at his lowest point. The Lord passed by. A great and strong wind rent the mountains, break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake came, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Elijah, at his lowest point, his emotions, his thoughts told him to run from Jezebel. He asked to die. He was suicidal. He he expressed the loneliness and the frustration and the hopelessness of his situation. And at that point in Elijah's life, God chooses to give Elijah an object lesson. Not wind, not earthquake, not fire, but the still, small voice. The still, small voice is not loud, not demanding not threatening, but the still small voice is the voice of God, the whisper of God into our hearts, into our spirits. So 1 Kings chapter 19, what can we learn from this object lesson that God was teaching Elijah? The wind, the earthquake, and the fire I would equate in this situation to our own human thoughts and emotions. Now God will do wondrous works. God just used fire miraculously just previously in Elijah's story. But when God was speaking to Elijah in this situation, he was not speaking to him through these powerful shaking elements. He was speaking to him in the still small voice. So what is wind? Well, wind just comes up suddenly. I don't know about you, but I can't control the wind. Wind just comes comes in suddenly and sweeps into an area and and, and it pushes forcefully. It it pushes stuff in a direction. You see a a tree, you know, kind of bending in the wind. You see a, a piece of paper just blown aside by the wind, just out of nowhere for reasons you can't control. The wind just comes into an area and pushes forcefully. Similarly, our emotions will try to bully us. Intimidation, the desire to please others, uh, insecurities will rise up. Maybe despair or discouragement will rise up just out of nowhere. You're just trying to live for God. You're just trying to do what's right. And all of a sudden, a wind blows into your life. And it's like, whoa, okay, well, that's really strong. I I feel really intimidated. I I feel really uh, uh, like I I need to make other people happy. I'm trying to live for God, but I, I feel like I need to make people happy. There's a strong wind blowing in my life. But God was not in the wind. The earthquake came. And, uh, uh, and uh, when an earthquake uh, comes, there's, there's a friction that happens deep below the surface. And, and there's a shaking when, when, that is, uh, when that occurs, when that's released. A, a shaking from deep down inside the earth. Still to this day, did you know, we can't predict earthquakes. And we can't prevent them. But God gives us the power to survive the shaking. Amen. So from deep down inside sometimes, there's just a shaking that will come up in us. Our, just, just out of nowhere, I couldn't predict it. I don't know how I could have prevented it, but my emotions will just kind of shake and rise. This, this strong way of thinking will just kind of come into, into me. There's an earthquake inside of me. Emotions rise, fear, panic, anxiety, deep sadness, sorrow from a loss. You know, God gives us our emotions, so our emotions are not the enemy. But as we're going through this process uh, lately that God is leading us us on, especially through this series, we're talking about having healthy emotions. Emotions are not the enemy, but God wants us to understand the emotions and be healed so that we can have healthy emotions. So, So if an earthquake of emotion or an earthquake of just thoughts just spinning out of control, we need to learn to stop and say, is that God? Is that the voice of God speaking to me? This earthquake is powerful, but is God in the earthquake? The fire comes, and fire, the nature of fire, it burns hot. And and we have things in our lives, anger, frustration, disgust. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, and I'm just like, 
worked up about something. And my day's hardly even started yet, but I'm already thinking about something at work or, or something that's not working out the way and uh, the way that I want. And there can be a fire burning in me. There, you could also think of lust, which is strong desire. That's a fire that burns in us. And, and strong desire can be a good thing when it's channeled in the right way. But, but when it's channeled in the wrong way, it leads to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And Elijah's at his lowest point. And God wasn't in the wind that was blowing in his life. God wasn't in the earthquake that was shaking in his life. God wasn't in the fire that was burning in his life. But God was in the still, small voice. I want to have my headset connected so that I can hear the still, small voice who knows things that I don't know, that can guide me when I don't know what to do, that can give me instructions when I'm facing a situation I don't know what to do about. The still, small voice is obviously, literally it's described as both still and small in our passage. Psalms 23 talks about the gentle leadings of God. And God's voice, of course, he can thunder. There could be a thunderous, audible voice today. God is capable of doing that. He could do that if he chooses to. But so often, he chooses to speak to us through that still, small voice that just gentle leading, that gentle impression, that gentle nudge. And so this can be such a revolutionary and such a powerful component to have active in our lives as we are living for God. But we got to be honest and say it can be tough to distinguish what is the still small voice and what is my thought and my emotions. Because I sometimes have a hard time discerning between human thought and human emotion in that still small voice. It would be easier if every time God spoke to us, there's just like thunder and lightning. Like, well, okay, well, obviously that was God because, you know, this whole room is just full of lightning. So, okay, we know that's God. So we can all kind of rest assured. But it doesn't work like that. You know, if, if, if there is that, you know, mighty thundering voice, you know, deeper than any human's voice could get, you know, just that, that epic classic voice of God, you know, my child, you know, it would be easier if that happened every time God spoke to us. But God wants us to live at a different dimension of intimacy and relationship with him where there's a still small voice that can speak into our spirits and into our hearts. So he's teaching each one of us. I truly believe if you are in this room, God is teaching you whether you know it or not, whether you're maybe, you know, trying to learn the lesson or not even aware of it or resisting or whatever the case may be. If you're in this room, God is trying to teach you to distinguish and to hear that precious, still, small voice. It's like uh, another example would be that of a gold miner. A gold miner, uh, of course, there's many ways to mine, but in the olden days, kind of the classic gold rush, you you picture someone, uh, you know, an old... Far, you know, old cowboy going out trying to find his, his riches, and he's got this pan and the stream where there's supposed to be gold in. The stream is flowing from the mountain, and he takes his pan, and he, he scoops out from the, the dirt and the sand and the rock and the gravel. It's at the bottom of the stream, and, and then he begins to sift it. And what he's really doing is trying to filter out, get rid of some of the dirt, get rid of some of the rocks, get rid of some of the, the sediment or whatever there may be because he believes that there's going to be some nuggets of gold, some, some gold dust, some gold gold specks in that pan. And so that's a little bit what life is like for us. There's no way that you're just, everything in your brain is going to be God. There's no way that everything in your emotion, in your heart is just going to be this continual, you know, like having the the audio Bible just like constantly playing. You know, there's going to be dirt. There's going to be sediment. You're going to, we we are in the world. God God doesn't necessarily call us to go live on a mountain alone by ourselves so we can just be, try to be super spiritual. You're going to talk to other people. You're going to hear the news. You're going to be around people. You're going to have your own uh, unresolved issues. And so in our life, there's going to be this flow of stuff really coming into our brains, coming into our emotions, coming into our hearts. And not all of it's going to be gold. So our job is to get that filter, get those filters, learn how to filter out some of the dirt. Ah, I had this thought today and it was, man, it was a strong thought. And I really thought about it for a while, but the more that that I kind of sat with it, I don't think that was God. 
I think that was me. Okay, I'm going to get that rock out of the pan because I'm trying to get to the gold. So I'm learning to filter out all the other stuff because I want the gold that God has for me. So we're going to look at a couple filters today, and and this is is no way comprehensive, but just to try to help us move forward in this journey of hearing God's voice. The first filter I want to talk about in discerning God's voice from human thought and emotion, the still small voice aligns with God's word and God's will. Contrast that with our own human thoughts and emotion. They may seem to be aligned at times, which can be confusing, uh, with God's word and God's will, but they always have their own agenda. But God's voice, as he speaks to you, it will not contradict the word of God. And it's not going to contradict the will of God and the plan of God. We have... Uh, thoughts, you know, you, you can't determine how God is speaking to you just based on the fact that a thought is still and small, that a, vo- uh, a thought might come to you that is very calm. That doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. Well, I thought you said that God speaks just through the still, small voice, the calm. Yes, but just because a, a, a thought just kind of pops in your head, and it's like, oh, maybe I should go do this, and there's no fire, and there's no earthquake, and there's no whatever. Well, that alone is not enough to filter out. So we're going to put together several filters together. And the first one is, yes, even if it's a a thought, it's not, you know, some crazy thing. "Ah, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go start a new nation. I'm going to go start a revolution. I just have this crazy thought because I'm so upset. It's like, okay, that's probably not God speaking to you. but, But you could just have a kind of peaceful, quiet thought, and it comes into your brain. But that alone doesn't mean that that's God just because the characteristic The thought or the voice is still and small. It's got to align with the word of God. God's word and God's will are filters for us. So the more familiar I am with God's word, the better I'll be at distinguishing God's voice. It's a filter. The more I know the will of God, the better I'll be able to determine. I really don't think like starting a revolution is what God is trying to do in the earth right now. That doesn't really seem like God's will. So I'm going to ignore that thought. I don't need to go start a new nation. I need to do what's in the word and the will of God. Moving on on quickly again, we could talk about that for a long time. But filter number two is that God's voice is consistent and reliable. Consistent and reliable. If you want to hear God's voice, I would make note of this. Our thoughts, our emotions are fickle and unstable, but God's voice is consistent and reliable. It's often like a river, right? A river flows through an an area, and over time, that river may change its course, right? That, That does happen, but in general, if you go to a river uh, today and then three months ago, you, three months in the future, you go back to the Connecticut River, it's basically flowing in the same direction. It's basically in the same location, basically doing the same thing. God's voice is consistent and reliable. Sometimes we want to chase, you know, something really exciting and flashy, and there are moments like that. Again, God works through wonders, the word of God, the wisdom of God, the wonders of God. There can be supernatural divine things, but when we're talking about the still small voice, God's voice is going to be consistent and reliable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is forever settled. One thing that's helped me uh, in my life to distinguish the voice of God from other sources, other noise, is to give it the test of time. There's something that comes to me like, oh, wow, you know, is, God, is that God speaking to me? If it's not something I need to kind of take immediate action on, I'll just give it the test of time. And I have found that sometimes if, if I'll just, I have a thought, I'm not sure about it, pray for it a couple days. If it's emotion, that emotion will usually die out. Because emotion is fickle and unstable. So, oh, go do this thing. And I'm all worked out about what I got to do. But, but then if a week from now I'm not excited about it anymore, maybe that was just human emotion. But if it keeps coming back to me, nah, I just, I just can't get away from this. I just keep feeling this. I just keep feeling this. That could be a sign that it's God's voice because it's stable and reliable. That river is flowing in a general direction. Sometimes maybe it's a raging, roaring river that's really easy to jump in the flow. Other times maybe it's a little bit calmer, a little bit quieter, but the river is flowing 
in the direction. It's not helter-skelter. It's not frantic. It's not jerked about by every uh, wind that comes. The river's not, there's a new president, and all of a sudden the Connecticut River is like flowing the opposite direction. That's not how it goes. That's fickle and unstable. That's not how God's voice is. For instance, in my life, hope you don't mind sharing a personal story, but I know right now it's God's will for me to work with youth and with college age uh, people. That's not all ministry for me, but I spend most of my ministry time thinking about how to help youth college age at the, at the campus hyphens. And, and so God is often speaking to me about that. I'm often hearing God's voice and maybe something we should teach in youth group or, or, or the next uh, event we're going to have for, for our district youth department. And, and so it's in that context and that general direct, direction right now in my life, that's a direction the river is flowing in, working with youth and with young people. Now, there may be a time where that river shifts, but just because I wake up tomorrow morning, it's like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do youth stuff. I don't want to do campus stuff. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm just, you know what? It's like, well, is that God's voice? Has anyone ever felt that way? Just like, I don't want to do this anymore. So is that God's voice? Well, let's see. If we run it through filter number two, the general direction, the way the river's been flowing in my life right now is that God is having me to continue to work with youth and with college age students. So I'm going to run it through that filter and say that doesn't jive. That doesn't make it through the filter. So I'm going to discard that thought. Now, a time may come where God wants me to change, and there's a new direction, but there's going to be a lot of checks and balances before I, I'm not just going to quit tomorrow because a thought comes in my brain. I'm going to wait until it's confirmed. It's gone through the test of time. It's gone through the, the, the wisdom of my spiritual authority. There's a lot of prayer that goes into it. I'm not just going to assume the river has started flowing in the opposite direction today. God's voice is reliable. Our hearts, the Bible teaches us, our heart is deceitfully wicked. Our emotions and thoughts can be so tricked and so fickle and the enemy would love to be able to rule your life because your life is based on whatever your emotion is today but God wants to lead you and guide you I can have a strong feeling I'm gonna I'm gonna go you know uh I'm gonna leave my spouse and I'm gonna go across the 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 oceans and and, and be a missionary and there's gonna be a billion people get the Holy Ghost I don't think that's the voice of God I don't think that's the voice of God that's some, that's some other voice. That's some other noise trying to lead me because that doesn't align with the word of God. It doesn't align with the will of God. It's not consistent and reliable with what God has already spoken to me. I want to be able to hear God's voice. Filter number three, and we're just going to talk about four filters today. Filter number three, God's voice comforts and gives peace. John chapter 14 Verse 26, this would be a great verse to note and to spend some time on this verse if you want to draw closer to God and learn about the Holy Spirit being active in your life. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The voice of God in my life comforts me and gives me peace. The Bible tells us that we're to seek or to follow after peace, to pursue peace. Peace is given to us to guard our hearts and to act as an umpire in our lives. So if a thought comes in to, to my mind and it's, uh, it's not peaceful, it, it causes me anxiety. Peace is like an umpire, right? A guy's running to first base and the umpire's got to say, safe, you can stay on first base or no, you're out of here. That's what an umpire does in baseball. And so the peace of God can be an umpire in my life when a thought comes into, you know, panic or, you know, what if something bad happens today? It's like, is that the voice of God? No, that didn't give me peace. That didn't comfort me. So you're out of here. You can't stay because the umpire, the peace of God, served me. If we were to compare how God's voice helps us versus how the enemy's voice works against us, some some. Uh, contrast might help us. God's voice calms us. The enemy's voice, the voice of emotions or thoughts of the world, worries. God's voice convicts us. Compare that with condemnation. God's voice is still. 
emotions and the world and the enemy, they rush us. God's voice encourages us. The world and the enemy and, and, and our emotions and thoughts, they discourage. God enlightens and brings revelation to us. The other noises, they confuse us. God's voice leads us. Other voices push us. A story to try to help illustrate this filter of, of comforting and giving peace. Um, Diana and I, we were preparing to get married a little over five years ago now. And we were trying to figure out our finances and make sure we had enough money to uh, get our apartment and move in and, uh, and just be okay and not, you know, have bad things happen because we didn't have enough money. And so she was, uh, she was leaving her company and also wanted to transition away from the role that she was in, the job that she had. Uh, and was, of course, moving an hour and a half this direction. So didn't have a lot of contacts, didn't have, uh, you know, a lot to rely on in that regard. And so we'd really been praying, God, you know, we, we know this is your will for, for us to get married. And, and we're moving forward and the date is set, but we could really use her having a job. So, you know, God, please make a way, please provide. We were praying about that situation and the weeks had kind of gone by and, and there nothing had really happened. I remember actually being in this, in this sanctuary, we're having an early morning prayer. Uh, I think Bishop had called it early morning prayer for, for um, people to, to gather. I remember walking on that back um, aisle back there in front of the sound booth. Just I was like six in the morning or something. You know, so I'm like just half asleep and praying and walking around back there. And, um, and of course, the, the main thing on my mind came to me was, okay, Lord, we uh, still really need help with our finances. We need a I need is a job, make sure that we have enough money that we need. And so I started praying that prayer again, and I felt the Lord speak to me, or maybe I should say I felt a voice speak to me and say, I've heard your prayer. You don't need to ask me again. Just rest, worship, praise. Give me thanks as an act of faith. Something along those lines. So let's pause for a moment. I'm just, I'm just living life. I'm not trying to be like Mr. Preacher, you know, be in the gifts or whatever. I, I'm just, I, my future wife needs a job so that we can have enough money. It's just a normal everyday situation. And I'm just trying uh, to do my best. And this voice speaks to me. These words come to me. And so how do I know if that was God talking to me or something else? Well, the best I can do is run it through the filters that we have. So First of all, does that align with God's word and with God's will? Does that seem like something that is in agreement with God's word? Don't worry. Just thank. Just, just give thanks. Just, pr just praise. It's an act of faith. You don't need to ask. I've taken care of it. I would say that that seems scriptural to me. Does anyone agree that that seems to align with God? Okay, so check mark. That, that seems right. Uh, I know that we're in God's will. We, we've already, that's been confirmed many times that we were supposed to get married. So I know that we're in God's will. So I'd say check mark with that. It's, is it consistent and reliable? Yes, I, I would say that reminds me a lot of what God often speaks to his people. You don't need to worry. You don't need to be frantic. You don't need to pray over and over again. Just give me thanks and just trust that I am working it out. Okay, I, 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 it's not a, a perfect test, but I'd say, yeah, check. That's pretty consistent, pretty reliable with the way God talks to us. Filter number three, did it comfort me and give peace? Yes, it absolutely did. It did comfort me and give me peace. That alone by itself, that's not the only test, but knowing that it aligns with the word, it aligns with the will, it's consistent and reliable that God has spoken to me and it comforted me and gave me peace. Okay, I felt pretty good about the fact that that was God speaking to me. I had just heard the voice of God. See, sometimes it, it can be so like, oh, you know, I want to hear God's voice, but how do you know, and how does it happen, and, and all this. But, but, but when we really get into the scripture and start seeing how God teaches us how we can hear his voice, it takes away some of that scariness and some of that uh, confusion about it. And our, our filter number four is going to be that it requires faith, and it did check that box as well. But um, so the the rest of the story, fast forward, uh, just like a, a two or three days maybe, she applied for a job uh, and and uh, told me about it, sent me a text like, hey, I should apply to this company, da, 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 whatever. And I said, wait, what's the name of that company? And so she gave it to me again, it's an Venture, and I said, oh, that sounds really familiar. And so where I was working, the owner of my company had a really strong connection with uh, one of the 
main people, one of like big bosses at the company she had just applied to. I said, oh, let me, let me go make sure that's the case. And so I went to the owner of my company and said, hey, do you know of uh, you know, such and such a company? And uh, she said, yeah, yeah, they're one of our clients. I said, oh, my wife just applied for a job there. And without, I think without me even asking, she said, well, send me some information about her. I'll give her a recommendation. And so God worked it out uh, a way that I could never plan. I didn't even know she was thinking about applying there. It never even occurred to me that that could be a place. God led her to apply to that job. Job, sent me a text. Oh, my boss just happens to have been doing business with them for years. And so a connection was made, a recommendation was made. She got the job. She's been there for, you know, five years as like seven promotions and has been doing great. And God worked that out. And so by learning to hear the voice of God and to trust the voice of God, he worked in our lives in a very special way to us. Filter number four, the still small voice is divine in nature and requires faith, not human reasoning. Our thoughts, our emotions, they look to justify themselves through human reasoning, not faith. God does not need to justify himself. There's no justification why, I, I, I mean, logically, I should have continued to pray that she would get a job, right? She doesn't have a job, logically. I know God is powerful. I should continue to pray to make sure that she gets a job. That's human reasoning. That's human logic. But God's voice required faith of me. No, stop asking. Don't pray. Just give thanks. And so God's voice often requires us to have faith. God's will, God's nature, and therefore his voice usually exceed the limits of human reasoning and therefore seems to be at odds with human reasoning. That doesn't mean, so we're trying to build, you know, we're trying to build a doctrine here. We're trying to build understanding here. That doesn't mean just because something that comes into my brain would require me to have faith. That doesn't mean that I just Go and do that. But if it checks the other boxes, if it's run through the other filters, and it requires faith, yeah, that's probably God. Because God's not just going to speak to me to do stuff that I already know to do, and it kind of logically makes sense. I mean, he could. But, but typically, God is going to be looking for me to stretch, to step out in faith, like Abraham, to, to leave on a journey not even knowing the destination that I'm going to. So God is speaking to you in ways that will require faith of you. I was listening to a sermon by Brother Billy Cole, who many of you are probably familiar with, just an incredible man of God, uh, and has passed away many years ago, but I was listening to a very old sermon by him, and, and he sh- was sharing some things about hearing from God, and one thing that he shared that I thought was just so insightful, was, and, and this is a person who has seen, I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not more, people receive the Holy Ghost. He's seen unbelievable miracles that you just wouldn't believe. I mean, if this guy is, you know, if, if somebody's plugged into the Spirit, this guy is plugged in to the Spirit. So I, I trust his experience. And he shared that often if we have a thought from God, it's usually the first thought that pops into our mind. And then immediately after that, or very quickly after that, there'll be another thought that's more logical, more reasonable. It's like, well, okay, you know, maybe, you know, yeah, maybe you shouldn't stand up and, you know, start prophesying or something. Like, you know, is that really, is it really the time to do that? And he said in his experience, I often found that when God was speaking to me, it was that first thought that it just, boom, it kind of didn't make sense and it required faith. And then immediately there'd be other following thoughts. They're like, whoa, okay, let's, let's think this through. Let's be reasonable. Let's be logical. Why is that the case? Because God's voice requires faith of us. God's not looking, he didn't assign us to like, Come up with all the reasons why everything makes sense. He assigns us, have faith. Believe and obey. Act in faith. Faith to step out and speak to a stranger about God. Faith to believe God's promises. Faith to trust God with whatever is happening. God is speaking to us in ways that require us to have faith. An example of this, maybe I have a thought come into my mind, you know, thought A maybe is, you know, I need to come up with a plan to figure out how to accomplish, you know, ABC, how to, you know, get my family who's not saved, get them into the church, or, or you know, how to, uh, you know, make more money in my life, or, or, or how to start some new ministry that's going to help a bunch of people. I got to really, I got to think about this, and I got to try to figure it out and come up with a plan. So that's thought A. But thought B is, you know, I should spend some time in prayer. And, and pray in faith that a solution will present itself that I can move forward with, that direction will be made clear 
in a way that I could not cause to happen and then just trust and thank God that he'll make a way. I would say that through all of our filters and through the filter of God's voice requiring faith, thought B is more likely to be the voice of God. It's not the voice that says, I gotta try to figure this out. I gotta try to understand. Uh, you know, maybe if I go back to school for two more years, then I'll really, no, no, no. The one that requires faith. And even right now as I'm preaching, God is requiring faith in some of you. I know this is just kind of teaching and there's a lot of bullet points and stuff, but God is, there are some of you that God is trying to work on right now and he is challenging you to believe what I am saying, that you can hear the voice of God. I, I absolutely believe that there are some of you sitting here that you've looked at others and you've discounted yourself. You said, well, that you know, powerful preacher or Bishop Hanson or whoever, they can hear the voice of God. They can be used in the gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit can move on them, but it's, I don't know if it's going to happen for me quite like that. I am challenging you this the voice of God is speaking to you and requiring faith from you. Believe that you can hear God's voice. Believe you're a sheep. You can hear the voice of a shepherd. You are the part of the sheepfold that the shepherd is speaking to. So how do we grow? As we kind of make the turn for home here this morning, how do we grow in hearing God's voice? I would say one of the most important things you can do is to get into the word of God. Get into the scripture. Because God has already spoken to us in his word. I mean, just the promises of God that are in his word. I, I love reading the Bible. I love spending time in the Bible. If you are bored with the Bible, it's because you're not going deep enough. If you'll go a little bit deeper, all of a sudden, oh boy, it gets exciting. I mean, man, I've been, I've been sitting at my Bible and then just like literally had to get up and start marching around the room speaking in tongues because I'm so fired up about what God's speaking to me through his word. Become a lifelong student of the word of God. That could be a whole 10-week series on its own. Number two, prayer. Get near God to hear God. Get near God to hear God. I can't hear a whisper from across the, the, the supermarket. I got to be standing next to my wife. So if she whispers, I can hear it. I need to get near God to hear God. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in prayer. It will change your life. Lower the noise levels of your thoughts and emotions any way that you can because that noise is competing against the whispers, the wind, the fire, the earthquake. That is competing against the whispers of God in your life. For me, that often looks like turning off some type of media for a while. And that allows me to eliminate some noise. You know, a lot of often headsets, it's not just about hearing and about being able to speak in a microphone, but they actually eliminate, right? Noise canceling headphones, they eliminate some noise around you. Any way you can do noise cancellation in your life. I reckon, maybe it's not forever, but honestly, like, whether you, whether you watch the news between now and November has zero influence on who becomes the president. So you could spend 4,000 hours watching CNN or whatever you want. It's not going to make a single difference. You get one vote. You get to cast your vote. Probably everybody in America already knows who they're voting for. Like, but yet we're going to pour so much energy and we're going to get so angry and so worked up. And so many articles we have to write and so many talk shows and podcasts and none of it makes a difference. Honestly, if you can cancel that noise or whatever it is, maybe it's someone in your life who just always drags you down. I mean, be kind, be a Christian, but sometimes it's okay to put boundaries and, and, and create some space in your life, remove some noise, because hearing the voice of God is more important to me than hearing the news or reading a book or anything else. I want to hear the voice of of my shepherd because I'm just a sheep out here. I'm just a poor little sheep out here that falls down sometimes and I can't win a battle against a wolf. I'm just a sheep. But if I can hear the voice of my shepherd, then I can hear him and follow him and obey him and he'll protect me. He'll provide for me. He'll care for me. I want to hear the voice of God. I need to hear the voice of God in my life. Ask One of the best things you can do if you want to learn and grow in your ability to hear the voice of God is get coaching from 
from bishop, from elders in your life. Learn. You think you something is, is God talking to me? Is God telling me to do this? Bring it to, to bishop. Bring it to an elder and talk about it with them. They'll help you to understand. Observe. I've learned so much just from simply observing those that are spiritually mature around me. I've been privileged to go to this church for my whole life for 31 years. And for 31 years, I've been watching many of you as you, as you journey on your life with God and I've learned so much about God's voice by watching you live out your lives obeying God obeying God to kind of put this all together one simple illustration I appreciate you guys hanging in here today uh, but if we can go to the the next slide it, before GPS you had to navigate without having this like you know thing that could solve the problem no matter where you are right GPS is wonderful, but there used to be a day, for those of you, you know, over like 40 years old or whatever, I don't know how long it's been, there used to be a day where you had to read a map, and so I would equate that to the Word of God. Now, there's no GPS, right, so it's kind of hard for us to picture a world without GPS, right, but just imagine, so you get crazy, you know, for a minute. There's no GPS. You should really learn how to read a map, because some of you may look at that and be like, uh, that didn't tell me anything. And some of us, unfortunately, Christians, we look at the Bible and say, oh, that didn't tell me anything. Learn to read your map. It will help you so much. It's not the only way God talks to you. It's not the, I, you, could, you could probably get to heaven without ever cracking your Bible. You probably could. But why would you do that? Why would you spend your whole life driving around and you don't have any idea how to read maps? So, so read the map. Learn how to read the map. Beware of signs. This is the wonders of God. God will sometimes come to you like, boom, with a vision. You're like, whoa, wow, that was really powerful. I love when I'm driving down the road and there's a big sign in my life that's like, hey, where you want to go, you know, exit 34 or whatever, go here. You want to exit 34, go here. And God sometimes gives us signs. God sometimes speaks to us in these ways. And it's awesome. It's wonderful. It's like, wow, the, the preacher got up and there's this great prophecy and it answered all these questions I had. That's amazing. I love when I'm driving down the road and there's a sign that I can follow. But some roads don't have signs. God will lead us on some paths where there's not always wonders. So that's part of it. Another part of it is getting directions from the right people. Those folks are talking to an officer to get directions. You know, they didn't go to, like, the guy who looks like he's in a gang who's like, yeah, go, you know, <laughs> just go down the alley here. There's some people that will help you out. No, he went to the right person to get directions. So I go to my pastor. I go to my elders, and I get directions. Help me. I, I, I'm reading this map, and I kind of know how to read it, but I'm not sure what this means. What does the map mean when it says this? And it helped me to understand. And then if I'm on the road before, you know, GPS, you get lost, the best thing you could do is have a cell phone because you could pick up your headset, say, hey, Dad, I know you're home right now and you got, you know, MapQuest or whatever it was back then. Uh, can you pull up this location I'm trying to get to? And can you, I, I see what looks like a highway up there. Should I get on that? Yes. That's the still small voice speaking into our lives. I've read the map. I'm aware of the signs. I've got good directions from the people that are my spiritual authority. And now the still small voice is guiding me on some of these decisions. Yep, this is the right, take this exit. Yep, that, that's the right one. You see, you see this thing? Yep, you're on the right path. So we want to bring all of these elements together in our walk with God. Final story I'll tell. I stood in an altar just like this one. And I wanted to hear God's voice for myself. And I really wasn't sure that I ever had. And I stood in that altar and I prayed, God, I want to hear your voice. I had just been in a service that was absolutely dynamic. Some of you might remember Gordon Winslow preaching in the East Hartford Church. And, I mean, it was the gifts of the Spirit. There were people getting healed. There was, I mean, it was incredible. And I stood as about a 14-year-old and said, God, I want to hear your voice for myself. I don't know if I ever have. And those doubts, boy, those doubts will do a number on you, won't they? I said, God, I want something that, that will help me with the doubt. So I'm, I, I just don't know. And so... I, there's an, of course, there's an altar, so nothing really happened at that moment. Of course, there's always thoughts running out of your mind, right? But it's like, you know, how do you know? You try, you do the best you can and stuff like this, but it's like, okay, I don't really know. 
And so we're praying kind of one for another in the altar service as we often do. And I went up to this gentleman. I'd never seen him before. It wasn't from our church. It was like a joint church meeting. And uh, I just lay my hand in his back and I pray for him. I was like, God, this would be a perfect opportunity. Like, I'm not praying for this guy. Just what should I pray for him? I, I really want to hear your voice. I, I really want to be sensitive to your spirit. And there was just one word that came to my mind. It wasn't a vision. It wasn't an audible voice. There's just a word popped in my, in my mind, if you will. And the word was Thomas. And so what happened? My brain kicked in. I said, all right, Thomas, okay, uh, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, I'm praying for this guy. I said, oh, in the Bible, Thomas was a disciple, and doubting Thomas, right, is what he's called. So I guess he had problems with doubt. So I was like, I don't know, I don't know what to do. Like, I think maybe God spoke to me, the word Thomas. And so I prayed. I said, okay, God, you know, help this man have faith, whatever, about, you know, whatever. Prayed for him, and so the service went on, and then it concluded, and had a little bit of fellowship time after, and we're, you know, walking around, talking to people, and greeting. I saw this guy they've been praying for. I said, oh, I'll go meet him. I don't know him yet. And so I went, and I shook his name, and I said, hi, uh, my name's Nathan. It's nice to meet you. And he said, oh, hi, it's nice to meet you. I'm Tom. And it took a second. I was like, wait, yeah, like as in Thomas? He said, well, yeah, like, my name's Tom. You know, like he didn't know what was going on. So are you serious? Like, you know, like, wow, it's great to meet you. This is incredible. You know, I was like having like a you know a breakdown. I was like so excited, like, oh, you know, and he's this guy's just you stand with me. It clicked in my mind at that moment. Wow. God allowed me to experience this. That still small voice. Maybe even a, a baby, you know, gift of knowledge, if you will, just a, just a seed starting. Gave me a knowledge I had no way of knowing on my own. Thomas. The guy's name was Tom. And that started a journey. Now, I've been praying for it. I've been believing for it. And I have thought I heard God, and I actually missed it. There's been other times I'm pretty sure God was talking to me, and I missed that. I didn't obey. I didn't whatever. And so it's been a journey for me, and it's a journey that I'm still on, and it's a journey I'm committed to staying on for the rest of my life. I'm not teaching this to you today because I have, I'm like the most spiritually sensitive person you've ever met. I'm absolutely not. But I am hungry for God's voice in my life. And so I go to his word to try to learn about how he talks to us. And I try to apply it to my life and say, God, teach me. Help me to grow in this so that I can be effective in your kingdom. So that I can have a relationship with you that's not just average, but God, I really want to have a relationship with you. I want intimacy with you. And what started to, to, to click in my mind, it started at, at that altar call when I was 14, but what's God started to really imprint on my spirit. And, and now, uh, many, many years later, God has continued to try to teach me this and get me to really believe this. What's said in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, when God was totally revolutionizing Peter's understanding that that the gospel is only for the Jews, but no, it's actually for all people. I mean, a massive major revelation. And Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Paul echoed this in his letter to the Romans, for there is no respect of persons with God. And I've spent a lot of my life acting like God is a respecter of persons. I've spent a lot of my life thinking, well, so-and-so, he's really spiritual, he's really used in the gifts, she's really, you know, seems like God just like comes down into her journal and like writes all these amazing, wonderful things that we then hear about at church, but, but I don't really know if God, no, God is no respecter of persons. What that means is he doesn't show favoritism. If God will speak to Sister Hanson, he will speak to you. Because if not, the word is not true and he's a respecter of persons. If God will speak to Bishop Hanson, he will speak to you. Because he said in his word that he does not show favoritism. That he's not a respecter of persons. Now some people are a little bit further in their journey. They, they've been listening to the shepherd for a long time and they really know that voice really well. So we're, we're all at different stages in our journey of being in the sheepfold, but don't be discouraged because someone else is just at a different point in the journey. I pray that you would really believe this today. God is no respecter of persons. God's voice is for you. God's still small voice is for you.
Maybe you feel, I'm not that spiritual. No, God is no respecter of persons. I'm not one of those elite, you know, people that, that seem to have it all together. God is no respecter of persons. I'm not qualified. I've messed up. I've done things wrong. No, God is no respecter of persons. Yes, you have your own personality, and, and it may look a little different for you than someone else. That's beautiful. That's what makes us the body of Christ. But God is not a respecter of persons. So I'm going to invite us to close this service here in the altar and we're, we don't need to take a long time today and we're not we don't need to really repent today I don't think we also don't need to try to make something happen but I'm gonna invite us to spend about maybe just five minutes maybe longer if the Lord wants but maybe just five minutes in the presence of God and our goal today is just to worship him to just be in God's presence uh, to, to take a moment and let this settle in and and if there are doubts in your mind if, if there are struggles in your mind I don't know if God God can talk to me. God is here to confirm his word. God is here to let this be settled and imprinted deep in your spirit. I am not a respecter of persons. I don't show favoritism. I haven't gifted uh, somebody with some great thing and I have nothing for you. No, the good father has gifts for all of his children. Why don't we just take a moment and just be in our Father's presence? Why don't we take a moment, just raise our hands, raise our voices, open the ears of our spirit to hear God's voice, to feel His impressions, to feel His love. God, we worship You. We praise You today, Jesus. We love You this morning, God. We worship You.